Okay. Uh, I'm Otto Shintani. I'm chairing this uh, last session on international diversification and uh, fiscal consolidation. And uh, we have two speakers. First speaker is Romain Rachiere, and you have 30 minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. Thanks so much for, um, for inviting me. Uh, I'm sorry not to be able to be there or to have been able to um, attend earlier, but it was in the middle of the night in uh, in Paris where I'm actually. So I think this is a joint work. Uh, let me just close my door one second. Yes. So this, this is joint work with uh, uh, Joel David, uh, used to be my colleague at uh, USC and David Zick who is my colleague at, uh, at USC. And uh, I think the, the starting point of, uh, of the paper is to is a desire to understand how globalization affect uh, labor market outcomes. So when a firm can diversify a financial, a financial internationally, what are the consequences of this international we sharing on the within we sharing uh, within the firms? And uh, what is its impact on on the on the labor share? Okay, so the 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 basic facts are just suggestive. Uh, if we know about the the rapid trend of financial integration uh, in the last fifty years, uh, you have it for the U.S., but you have it for GDP weighted uh, global average. Uh, we also uh, we also know that in the same period, there have been a uh, decline uh, in the labor share in the US, but also in many uh, advanced uh, economies. And so the purpose of this paper is to try to understand whether or not uh, we could establish a link between international diversification and fluctuation in the labor share. So if you go one step further, you can just uh, regress uh, the labor share on a measure of foreign equity liabilities uh, controlling for a country fixed effect, and you get uh, a negative uh, uh, partial correlation uh, between the residuals of, uh, of the labor shares uh, and the foreign equity uh, liabilities. So I think the, the paper uh, is both theoretical and, uh, and empirical. Uh, so the theoretical part is proposing a relatively simple framework uh, in which uh, firms are choosing inputs and particular labor uh, while they are facing aggregate risk, or more precisely that their firm-specific productivity risk is correlated with some countrywide uh, market risk. So in this work, where you have to choose uh, labor and to commit uh, to wages before you observe uh, the shock, then your ability to diversify uh, your risk uh, will affect uh, your input decision, hence will affect uh, the labor share. So if you are insuring your workers, for instance, by providing them preset uh, wages, uh, if you are are very exposed to uh, high get risk, then it's very costly for you to provide such insurance if you cannot diversify this uh, risk away. And as a consequence, uh, you will actually hire uh, less labor. Uh, you will not be at the riskless uh, optimum and the labor share will be also lower. So what's happened in this world when you have opportunities to diversify your way the country specific risk by exchanging shares with uh, firms in other countries. So what's happening is now uh, the implicit cost of insuring your workers uh, became uh, lower uh, because you are have access to a source of diversification of the risk you are facing when you provide such uh, insurance. So in fact, this actually encourages you to uh, to hire more and the labor share of uh, of output uh, will go uh, will go up. So that's uh, called the within effect. But that's not the end of the story because in the in the world when you have heterogeneous firms that have a different exposure to country risk, 
the firm will benefit the most for the diversification are the firms that are more exposed to this risk in the first place. And so you're going to have relocation towards firms that are more risky, which has low labor share. And so the overall effect on get labor share depends on the on the net effect of these two effects. And that's interesting because in the recent uh, work, uh, Karen Vincent, for instance, tried to decompose the change of labor share. They observe precisely that, that the medium firm's labor share is going up, while the labor share is going down because of relocation of production towards firms that have, uh, that have low labor share. So we're going to just work out the analytics of this simple uh, model of input choice uh, under an insurable risk. And then we're going to show you what's happened when you decrease the price of, uh, of risk. And then we're going to look into, uh, into the data and, uh, and we're going to focus uh, mostly on, on firm level uh, analysis. And uh, we're going to establish two results. Uh, first, uh, that uh, riskier firms actually have lower uh, labor share as a model uh, predict. And we're going to also look at what happens when you can diversify internationally. And, and we're going to confirm that will be a relocation to riskier low labor share firms. And then we're going to conclude the unpaid exercise by uh, by a kind of uh, a cross-country regression just to, to, to look at the net effect on the labor share, which we find is a falling the sizable effect. I have to apologize to the discussion that the OMPIX has been a little bit to a shuffle uh, since, uh, uh, since the paper was, um, last draft was, uh, was produced. So I will skip the literature in the, in the benefit of time. So you have uh, a literature on financial diversification. I have actually done some work on that as well. A literature on the decline in the labor shares, which look at the various range of explanation in, involving trade, uh, offshoring, uh, technology, uh, automation, superstar firms, but kind of ignore uh, the dimension of risk and in, in ignore the dimension of change in the price of risk associated with financial realization. And then there is another literature to which my uh, co-authors have contributed, which is precisely to try to understand uh, how much risk and uh, affect uh, input allocation. In principle, actually a lot of results that people have discussed on misallocation can actually, actually, there is far less misallocation when you compute the risk adjusted uh, productivity versus just productivity. So just to give you a little bit of a broader perspective that take into account risk exposure in, uh, in, in input choice of production can go quite a long way in explaining some uh, of the puzzles that people have found in the, in the literature. Okay, so the model is a model with heterogeneous firms uh, that are uh, producing using capital and labor, and these factor positions are chosen in advance to maximize market uh, market value. So the wage or the rental of capital cannot be conditioned on next period shock realization. So it's a bit maybe extreme, but all what we need for the result to go through is some kind of imperfect path through uh, of the risk. So some degree of wheezing firm uh, insure. So the firms are owned by investors uh, who are uh, facing a stochastic discount factors. Now we put it as exogenous and, and we're going to introduce it later in the G model uh, of multiple countries. Okay, but just, uh, so the firm maximize uh, the expected, uh, expected uh, discounted profit that will be distributed in form of dividends. And so you see immediately what something will be key will be the covariate between the stochastic discount factors, which reflect the, the market risk uh, and the firm specific productivity shock uh, AY. So when you, when, you, when you solve for the first order condition, uh, you're gonna see 
that the labor share is not equal to the share of uh, labor in the Poisson functions as standard in, in Cobb Douglas technologies. But these times a terms, one plus kappa, where kappa, which capture the risk, the first specific risk premium, depend precisely on the covariance between uh, between the market risk and the firm uh, specific, specific risk. So if the productivity is procyclical, where the stochastic disform factor majority of consumption is countercyclical, then this risk premium is actually uh, positive. It's costly uh, for firms to insure uh, workers, and this results in them hiring less workers and less capital, or saying differently, having a higher profit share to compensate for the for this insurance uh, provided. And so that's uh, that's a link. So the, the riskier you are, or the higher beta firms for people who are in finance will also have lower labor share. So that's something that will be that will be testable. I mean, we could extend that to any type of production function like like CS or more generally, and you will always find this uh, risk adjustment in the in the input choice. Okay. So um, so from that you can compute the aggregate expected uh, labor share that depend on the joint distribution of the micro level output and, and labor share. And you can compute the inputs, uh, the inputs relative to an industry or the country or the, uh, the output. And you get an expression for the aggregate uh, labor share. So let's go uh, one step further and decompose this Swiss premium I just mentioned. So this depends on the covariance between epsilon r, which is a firm specific risk, and the stochastic discount factor. That's a quantity of risk, but times the variance of the of the stochastic discount factor. That's actually uh, the price of risk. Uh, the quantity of risk is firm specific. It's an exposure, it's kind of uh, exogenous. The price of risk is uh, is common across firms and uh, and and it will be on the genus. If the price of risk uh, is uh, is falling, then the kappa term will be will be falling. So let's uh, assume without specifying it for a moment that the price of risk uh, is going down. Then you have uh, the two effects I mentioned before. So you have a within effect the firm level uh, labor share uh, increase, but there is a relocation effect. So we saw shifted toward riskier uh, low labor share firms, the one that benefits more from the fall in the price of risk. So you can decompose it formally between a relocation effect and a within uh, effect. So the net effect is ambiguous, and as you're going to see, will be non-monotonic in the decline in the price of risk. Okay, so we can have various example. One is with a whiskey and a safe firms. Uh, one with be uh, with Gaussian technologies with different exposure to market risk. But this is just um, this is a Gaussian example, but that's basically the same thing. Um, so what's uh, um, interesting is to look at what happened when the when the price of risk is going down, and this kind of measure of uh, kappa is also going down. So if you, of course, for the for the safe firms that have no exposure to uh, to risk, nothing happened. The labor share just uh, the uh, the labor share in the production functions. But for the other one, as the price of risk is going down, uh, the labor share is actually uh, going up, up to the point that when you go back to risk-free world, uh, it's just equal to the labor share. So in the meantime, production starting to shift from uh, the whiskey firm to the safe firm to the whiskey firm. Remember, Upswell 94 is all about that. So you can diversify the risk. So now you actually are moving from, uh, from, from safe to, uh, to whiskey project. Of course, consider that the the whiskey firm generate the higher returns. Okay, so what will be the effect on the agate macro labor share? That's basically ambiguous, and what we can show analytically 
is that uh, initially the re relocation effect uh, dominates, but eventually the within effect will dominate because at the end, when you are going back to this free world, it has to go back up to alpha. So that's uh, what the macro labor share is um, is doing. Well, how much time? I, I try. I didn't keep track of the time. Can we tell me a little bit? You have about fifteen more minutes. Fifteen. Okay, it's perfect. So then I uh, I will show you what's happened when you diversify. But you you already can guess the result. Basically, what I'm going to do is to make this Swiss premium uh, endogenous. Okay. So so you have uh, two type of agents, uh, workers, provide labor and cannot participate in asset market and capitalists who own firms and can trade financial assets internationally, but at some cost, okay? So, so you have uh, the risky productivity uh, is uncorrelated across uh, countries. So there are obvious benefit of uh, diversifying uh, internationally, but in order to diversify, you need to pay the cost of, uh, of holding these uh, foreign shares or issuing shares to, uh, foreigners put in this different way this is proportional to the holdings. You can still trade uh, costlessly the, the risk free bond. So there are three potential equilibrium. Uh, if it's free to trade international asset, then you are back to, and if you don't have any global risk, then you can perfectly diversify your country specific uh, risk and, uh, and you go back to its neutral pricing. If it's very costly to diversify internationally, then you, you prefer not to trade and you are still in the So the interesting result happen in the interior uh, solution. So now by just imposing um, a kind of a no arbitrage condition that uh, the price of the shares are valued by domestic and foreigners, should be the same. Uh, so the domestic face this correlation uh, with uh, between the country specific firm, firm specific risk and country risk, and the foreigner has to pay uh, the tax. Uh, then when you impose this risk free condition, you can just pin down, uh, you can just pin down this uh, risk premium that will depend uh, on the cost of uh, trading and the parameters of the production function. So now let's uh, do the following experiment. Assume that the cost of foreign investment of holding foreign chains goes down, then uh, investor will uh, diversify. Uh, so the price of risk uh, and the risk premium uh, is gonna be uh, decreasing and you're gonna have these two effects I mentioned before, the within effect, increasing the labor share and the reduction effect, decreasing the the labor share and all the analysis that we made on this on the business parameters kappa is premium. Now we can make it on the existing parameters uh, too, but the results are exactly the same. Uh, uh, so uh, initially, uh, financial diversification uh, decreased the labor share by relocating productions to where more risky but lower labor share firms before eventually uh, rising again. Okay. So the, the, the umbilical part is trying to test some prediction of um, uh, some prediction of the models on um, if since the result really depend on this heterogeneity um, of, uh, of firm uh, exposure to risk, we need to start with firm level data. Uh, and we're going to show, we're going to show you some trend in the, in the labor share across country that suggests that any potential explanation for its decline has to take into account this both within and relation dimensions. Uh, then we're going to uh, do the test. That is actually the first test that show that a uh, risky firms firm with a high beta has lower labor share. And, uh, and then we're going to look at what's happened with the rise in foreign equity liabilities. Of course, this is endogenous, so we're going to have to use some instrumental uh, variable uh, to tease out the, the causal effect. Okay, so if, uh, if you look at, uh, 
at the data, it's quite striking uh, that when you look at the cumulative decline in labor shares, uh, this is for the G7 country or for the US, uh, the decline in the, in the labor share really reflect two contrasting trends. Uh, the increase in the within effect combined with, uh, with the relocation effect. And this is true for the average G7 country for the US, but this is actually also true for individual countries. You have Germany, France, Italy, Japan, and, and the UK. And so and it's also true uh, if you look across versus within industries. Uh, so you have a lot of this relocation uh, take place uh, within industry versus uh, across industries. Yeah. Okay, so now uh, we go back. I mean, this is just providing some trend. Uh, I, I think for the US, this has been established um, for um, for firm level data by Kerry and Vincent. And uh, and for computer data by analytic and and quarters, but we showed it for a larger set of countries. Just putting the 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 information that an explanation of the kind of labor share that match data should be able to address these two uh, components. Okay. And our um, hypothesis, actually, uh, if true, will actually carry these two components. So then the question is whether whiskey firms are actually having a lower uh, uh, labor share. So we compute uh, the betas, uh, and then we visualize the betas on country uh, industry uh, year, because when you have relocation, since the betas have to sum to one, you have a mechanical effect on the, on the betas, and we don't want that. We want the, the beta to stay to stay constant. So we look at the relative beta than the absolute uh, beta. So the beta compared to the average beta uh, in your uh, industries. Uh, the labor share, labor compensation of a value added. Uh, there are some issues I will not talk much about reporting in Compus US. Interestingly, when you go, because many countries do not really, uh, do not really uh, provide uh, information on labor compensation on their filing. Actually, it's much better in CompuStat, uh, in CompuStat uh, 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 Global, okay. so which has uh, uh, advanced economies outside uh, the US. Uh, so when you, again, take the residual of regressions that I will put into in a minute, you get this uh, strongly declining relationship between uh, the log labor share and relatively beta. So whiskey firms uh, have also lower uh, labor share. So you could look at uh, the regression uh, in this uh, uh, log labor share with respect to, um, to the betas uh, and to set of uh, control and fixed effect, including uh, industry country years. Uh, and what you find is a consistently negative uh, relationship with an importance um, a magnitude. Uh, so once our deviation in betas will lead to a, a reduction of the labor share by four to eight uh, percent. Uh, here we look at duration with, uh, with uh, country specific betas, but you can put additional control uh, the global uh, relative betas and the results are, are untouched. Okay, so that's for the the compus that global, and you get the same thing for uh, for compus that uh, US. Very similar result. Okay, so that's of course a key pillar uh, for our kind of uh, empirical uh, strategy. If we didn't find that, then particularly the paper would have would have stopped there. Uh, but fortunately, this seems to be not rejected by the data. So we can go uh, we can go a bit uh, a bit further uh, and look at what's happened when you uh, when you diversify, whether you observe uh, this relocation that I uh, I mentioned 
uh, I mentioned before. Okay. Roman, you have about five more minutes. Five. Okay, I, I should be fine. So basically, we try to have a very stringent specification when you look at the change uh, in relative sales of uh, labels by uh, a firm in an industry uh, compared to the uh, regress on the change in this foreign equity liabilities measured by at the country level interacted with the beta at the at the firm level okay uh, and what you observe it is a positive result uh, at the in OLS regressions and but now we use an IV, and uh, I won't have time to decline to 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 develop the IV very much. But the idea is very simple: that uh, uh, it's a bit like a shift share uh, instrument. So your liabilities in the US are assets from the rest of the world, and uh, so and the IMF has created this survey from the CPIS and CDIS for portfolio investment and direct investment, we actually give the share of uh, each uh, country assets uh, on other countries' liabilities. And we're gonna actually uh, uh, take the shares for the previous years and then look at the change in the total asset of, uh, of a country, excluding the country um, of, um, of interest, like the US, for instance. And then measure uh, the change in the foreign equity liabilities in the US uh, using this instrument of the increase uh, in the assets of uh, other countries uh, weighted uh, by uh, by the share of uh, of each uh, of each countries. So when you get the IV result, the IV result. Uh, uh, in fact, similar, if not, uh, uh, if not stronger. Okay. So, if you have an increase in foreign equitabilities of what you observe, one point seven percent a year, this will actually make the high beta firm grow by zero one to zero two percent uh, every year. But know that this trend is over uh, fifty years, so that actually can lead to significantly. A uh, large increase in the size of those uh, those firms, and then to to wrap it up, we use the same type of uh, approach uh, on the cross country regression with the same instrument, and uh, this is just to uh, to 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 get an, an aggregate effect, and the aggregate effect suggests that in the panel of country years we have, uh, we are on the downward sloping curve, so there have been a decline. In the labor share associated with uh, uh, with uh, financial diversification, and so if you look at uh, at the U.S., uh, you could explain a fall in the labor share of two to three percentage points, which is one about one uh, more than a third between a third and a half of what had been observed. So I, I can uh, I can conclude. So we provide a, a theory linking international diversification to the aggregate. Uh, labor share, which is consistent with the within and relation effect observed with the data. And uh, we seem to have economically uh, robust um, uh, result, but also economically um, significant, magnitude economically significant. Uh, an important aspect of the model, if we predict it forward, is that the decline in the labor share in that world can be only uh, temporary, uh, as uh, diversification became uh, less and less costly, then you can expect actually the reason effect to dominate and the labor share uh, to stabilize or even to reverse. This is a bit in contrast with some of the theory of the, kind of the labor share that tend to have very grim uh, outlook going forward. In our case, no, it's just uh, two effect and one tend to initially dominate, but the other one eventually uh, overtake it. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. You are right on time. And discussion is course karaoke, please. Hi, Kosuke.
Yeah. 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 Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. Um, and hello, Roman. So it's a great pleasure to discuss the paper about Roman because uh, we used to be colleagues at uh, Cray. Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona for almost 20 years ago. So <laughs> I'm very glad to uh, discuss uh, his paper. Okay. Um, okay, so here's a uh, uh, just the research question. Okay, so, so they try to draw some implications of risk sharing, international risk sharing on the labor share. Actually, this is, yeah, to me, this is a very interesting, and also this is a new question, okay? And in this paper, they provide this new theory, and also they provide with uh, convincing empirical studies. Okay, so this is both empirical and theoretical paper. And so they have many interesting results, okay? First, at the firm level, so here's the main conclusion. So suppose that uh, the price of risk declines. Okay? So then uh, their theory predicts that the labor share within a firm uh, increases. Okay? So this is within firm effect. And the second uh, result is when the price of risk declines, a risk riskier firms with lower labor share expands. Okay, so this is what they call a reallocation method. Okay. And so this is the basic theory. And they uh, try to apply this theory to the literature on international risk sharing and draw implications for labor share. Okay. So suppose that uh, international risk sharing improves, so therefore the price of risk declines. Okay. So then uh, their theory so has two, two implications, right? So labor share within a firm increases. So this is a within firm effect. Okay? And also riskier firms with lower labor share expand. So this one tries to decrease the labor share in aggregate. Okay? So there are two offsetting effects in the aggregate level. And what they show is when the degree of risk sharing is not too large, then uh, aggregate labor share declines because the real the allocation effect dominates the within effect. Okay. So that's their basic uh, message in this paper. And also they uh, provide a number of convincing empirical evidences. And one of the killer charts I like in this paper is uh, this chart. Okay, so they plot the labor share on the vertical axis. And on the horizontal axis, they plot the uh, measure of international risk diversification. So if you go from the origin to the, to the right, the degree of international diversity diversification increases because uh, more foreigners uh, become stakeholders in, in those firms. Okay. And uh, their theory implies that there should be a declining relationship, a negative relationship between international risk sharing and the labor share if the, if the diverse, diversification is not too large. Okay. 
And according, well, obviously, those two charts uh, clearly show that indeed there's a negative relationship. Okay. And in, so since I only have limited amount of time, uh, I mainly focus my discussion on the theory and intuitions behind what's going on. So here's a theory. Okay. So they think about a decision, a production decision of firms owned by risk averse agents. Okay. So look at this uh, equation. Okay. So production minus weight deals minus payment to capital. So that's a basic profit function. But uh, you have this stochastic discount factor, which is lambda. So here, uncertainty is regarding this uh, idiosyncratic productivity shock, AI. Okay. So this form is owned by risk above agents. And as long as consumption and productivity are positively correlated, positively correlated then the stochastic discount factor is negatively correlated with A. So this means that those owners value profit in bad states by more and profit in good states by less compared with risk averse owners. Okay. So that's the setting. And two assumptions. Okay. So demand for labor and capital are determined before this productivity realizes. Okay. So you have to make those input decisions in advance. And also, and it's like sticky prices. So factor prices, W and P, K, are already determined. Okay. So those are the two uh, basic assumptions. Okay. So then uh, what do they do? So those, are, those two equations are the first order conditions for factor inputs. Uh, the first one is for demand for labor. And second one is for the demand for capital. Okay, so this is very similar to the basic uh, first order condition. And of course, the right hand side is wage and the price of well, user cost of capital. And this is, well, you, well this, this sounds, well, this looks familiar to you. Actually, this is the marginal product of capital. But because firms are owned by risk averse agents, you have risk correction. Okay, and similarly, uh, for the capital, uh, the, the user, price, uh, user cost of capital is the right hand side, and the left hand side is the risk adjusted marginal product of capital. Okay. And basically, uh, they provide or they draw very interesting and rich implications of those two equations and related to uh, in the international uh, risk sharing context. Okay. So one implication, one uh, result is from those from the first equation, uh, you can derive the labor share of income. Okay. So here the labor share of income is defined as the wage payment as a ratio of expected uh, output or average output. Okay. So then uh, so alpha, remember, I forgot to explain. Alpha is the productivity parameter in the is in the cop diagram production function. So therefore, if there's no risk correction, of course, the labor share is going to be alpha, but it's corrected by risk. And as long as the covariance is negative, then the labor share is going to be less than alpha two. Okay, so that's the uh, main result of this paper. Okay. And what are the implications of those first order conditions? So those are the first uh, first order conditions I just showed you. Okay. So even though uh, while they are focusing their attention to the labor share and labor demand decision, actually when the covariance is negative, firms demand both labor and capital by less. So because the risk correction is not only in the demand for labor, but also it's there, the demand for capital equation. Okay. So because uh, this risk correction affects both decisions, 
as long as uh, there's uncertainty, a production level itself is smaller. And as a, as a result, suppose that the price of risk declines, then the labor demand and, and capital demand increase. So therefore, production expands. Okay, so that's the second effect, a second result of this their paper. Okay. So those two implications have many interesting, potentially interesting implications. Okay, so first, so this is, uh, sorry. So this is the killer equation. Okay, so the labor share declines when the covariance term is negative. But uh, you have a similar implication for the compensation of capital. Okay, so I, I'm not saying that this is capital share, actually. So this is payment to capital divided by uh, average productivity. Okay, and it's also becomes smaller than alpha one. Okay, but uh, it does not mean that capital share <laughs> declines because it's impossible. Uh, it's impossible that both capital share and labor share decline. Okay. And what's going on is uh, capital share is usually defined as the operating surplus divided by value added. Okay. And operating surplus is income from property. And in this case, this is like P times K. Okay. And income from entrepreneurship. Actually, in this model, that corresponds to profit. Okay. So because basically capital, capital income is profit, sorry, uh, value added minus wage bill. So therefore, as long as uh, wage bill declines, the uh, capital share increases, even though the payment for compensation of capital declines. And I think this has an interesting um, observation that can be tested. So one observation is, again, from those two first order conditions, you can draw, uh, you can compute the ratio of factor payments, WL divided by P times K. And that's not going to be affected by risk. So this is simply alpha two uh, divided by alpha one. And so therefore, capital labor ratio is not going to be affected by this, even though labor share is going to be affected by this. Okay. So I, I think uh, this property of the model, uh, while this is interesting and new, and this can be also used uh, in order to distinguish this theory from other theories of labor share. So in this world, or in this paper, uh, labor share does well, labor share declines not not because not because firm substitute uh, labor for capital. Okay. Uh, many of the existing theories of the labor share well, starts from the standpoint that firms try to substitute labor labor and capital, but this is not what's going on in this paper. Okay, so therefore, so this. Theory has an interesting property that labor sorry, uh, input ratio is not going to be affected. So this is a unique, unique prediction compared with the other theories of labor share. So therefore, somehow, if they can test uh, this prediction, I think it enhances the validity of this theory. Yeah. And also, another in interesting thing is it's not form size. Okay, so some theories uh, focus their attention to the firm size because larger firms tend to have lower labor share. Okay. But in this theory, it's not the firm size, but it is the risk that determines the labor share. And this also can be tested in order to increase the validity of this model compared with the existing model. Okay, and one more. Uh, observation. So this is a comment on an uh, empirical part of their paper. Okay. So the theory uh, predicts that increasing risk sharing has two offsetting effects. 
the within term effect and and the the, other, the allocation effect. Okay. And the theory predicts that when the degree of um, in this sharing is not too large, then the real, the allocation effect dominates. Okay. So therefore, from a theoretical point of view, there may be a nonlinear relationship. But as far as we saw the data, uh, the relationship looks monotone. Okay. So therefore, it may be interesting to check whether you they can detect a nonlinear relationship between the degree of international risk sharing and the labor share. And finally, this is not the, this comment is not really related to labor share, but I thought that this theory has another interesting uh, implications, which is about uh, firms pricing decision. Okay. So, if I computed the real marginal cost of this form, I think the real marginal cost function looks like this. So this is going to be a weighted average of ways and the uh, user cost of capital divided by average productivity. So, well, if you only have those two terms, that's a standard uh, marginal cost function if you have a Cobb Douglas production function. But uh, since forms, Make input decision in, in, in advance. And first order conditions are corrected by this covariance term. So, therefore, this risk affected, affects the real marginal cost of firms. Okay. So, then the degree of uh, a change, a change, some changes in the degree of risk sharing can affect real marginal cost. So, therefore, it can affect pricing decision of firms. So therefore, it may have some implications for long term, longer trend of inflation. Okay. And also, if you think about uh, monopolistic, monopolistically competitive firms, what they see when they choose their prices is this uh, this adjusted marginal cost. But when econometricians try to measure market, Typically, we often ignore what we, we used to ignore this, this correction. Okay. So therefore, if you take risks into account, the properly measured markup and its fluctuations can be different from the traditional measures of markup. And also, I think this is going to be an important uh, and interesting avenue to future research. And anyway, so this is a great paper and I enjoyed uh, reading this paper. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kosuke. Woman, can you reply to this person's comment? Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, maybe I can, uh, maybe we should stop sharing or should we keep sharing? I don't know if we stop sharing. Do, as you... ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> Do you want to use his slide or no? No, I, I, I have, I have. I have digested it, so I don't. Uh... So thank you very much, uh, Kosuke. It's actually a great pleasure to uh, to to see you again. Uh, we were actually uh, indeed colleague at Cray uh, uh, nineteen years ago, so it's almost. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's always uh, great to interact with you because you have a a, a clarity of minds that uh, that I'm usually struggling uh, myself with. So. Uh, getting insight from you is always very, very uh, enlightening for me. So I think uh, uh, you made uh, basically uh, uh, three points. Uh, the points on firm size, uh, it's actually, we should notice that our result, uh, we are controlling from uh, firm size. Uh, maybe we should emphasize it more, uh, but that's something we control for. Uh, I think the the result on the... Uh, the result on the capital labor ratio, I think it's it's really important. And I haven't, I was a bit stuck because I saw that uh, maybe we could try to measure profit shares and and uh, and capital share, but it's very difficult to distinguish uh, profit share and capital share uh, in the data uh, as Kosuke just mentioned. But I haven't thought about actually trying to test directly for the capital labor ratio. And actually, if it works, it will be very good for us because 
as you just said, most of the result on the decline of the labor share has something to do with substitution between capital and uh, and labor, or different type of labor uh, and uh, and capital. So if we see that our our result uh, are, are are standing, uh, meaning that risk do not affect capital uh, labor ratios. Uh, that will be uh, a, a strong uh, result for us. So we, we will try that. Uh, on the nonlinear ET of the result, I mean, in some graph, you see the, the effect tend to be flattening. Uh, so it's strongly decreasing first in the degree of function integration, and then it's tend to flatten. In some cases, it's going to go up a little bit. Uh, so we could put uh, quadratic terms. Uh, or we can try something a bit non-parametric. The problem is that uh, uh, when you put non quadratic terms, we find this nonlinear effect, but I think it's a bit too demanding from the from the data, especially the cross-country data. Uh, and I don't think that will be so nice because we're going to pick up something and get, oh, yes, you see, this is going up. But in fact, it's going to be depending on a few points. And so, yeah, so the overall result is uh, that uh, uh, the theory uh, is ambivalent on the uh, effect. Uh, what we tend to, to find is that the relocation effect uh, tend to dominate. And it's not surprising because the relocation effect is something that is strongly uh, observed uh, in, the, in the data. Uh, I think the, the, other, the, the last point, uh, there is actually not three points, but four points, is about the real marginal cost. And uh, again, it's something that I thought about it, but uh, now that I saw the slides of uh, Kosuke, it became uh, it became much clearer uh, to me. That's true. I believe uh, uh, what people measure as a markup uh, actually is not only uh, is not only competition, uh, but it also de facto embed this element of uh, of risk. So we have implication uh, that even in a world where markup. Uh, uh, where theoretical markup are constant or markup implied by competition are constant, like in the more policy competition models, you can you could still have variation in motion markups that are coming from risk. And then, of course, if there is variation in motion markups in this model uh, with sticky wages, there will also be implication for uh, for inflation. So that's something that uh, also I kind of thought about a bit very confusedly, but now it's clear. That might go a bit beyond the paper, but uh, that's something probably worth uh, exploring because I think we don't have the, a very good theory linking uh, financial exploitation to inflation. We have it for trade, but not for financial exploitation. So that could be uh, a, an avenue for, for future research. So thanks again. Uh, I, I learned quite a lot from the discussion and it's, uh, it, was a, it was a pleasure to follow it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Now. We take a uh, comment from Flo. Uh, hi, Roman. Thank you very much. Thank you. I can <laughs> see. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Great paper. I, I, I don't have a major comment, but I just uh, noticed a little bit minor part, which is uh, you are looking at the equity flows in the data, that looks like. While uh, looks like you are in a theory, you are assuming uh, non-contingent pay to capital owners, which is a debt flow, more likely, I, I believe. So, and we do know debt flows and equity flows in international capital market are a little bit different. Maybe you can think about more, or maybe you can even write another paper <laughs> distinguishing between them. Yeah, so I think, uh, uh, yeah, so payments to capital owners are uh, uh, for the rental part of uh, the capital is actually fixed. Uh, but of course, if you also have equity on the firm, then your payments will be uh, will be varying. So there are some clear element of equity uh, diversification. Uh, that's what we have looked at. We haven't looked at uh, depth, uh, and and more importantly, maybe or as importantly, we haven't looked at the consequence for the risk-free rate. Mm -hmm. uh, that will be something we also plan to to do. So yeah, so I think it's 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 something we haven't explored. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay, sure, uh, okay, thank you for the very interesting paper. 
Uh, following up on the previous uh, comment, uh, in this paper, both wages and rental payments are, are predetermined, so they're both kind of uh, subject to the same degree of rigidity. What? So in that sense, uh, as Kosky made clear, both types of factors are kind of symmetric, and symmetrically in the model. What happens if you keep maintain the wage rigidity but make the the rental part more flexible? Which seems like a realistic uh, assumption. But, but by the way, that the uh, COG since uh, you you know maybe. Uh, uh, you I, I think uh, I heard uh, from Roman before that Roman just uh, started the job at Pompey Fabra after COG. Right. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if the Pompey Fabra before Goldscape. Remember? <laughs> yeah, so it's, uh, it seems the half of the room is former colleagues of mine. <laughs> 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 Either at the IMF or at the IMF. No, so I think uh, the, the question is, uh, is a good one, uh, uh, and it tells it a little bit brings to how far we want to push the model in some sense. Uh, so far, the model is uh, uh, is 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 really broad to make uh, the argument, uh, and so we have this symmetry between capital and labor. Uh, we don't have bankruptcy. Uh, we don't have uh, leverage. Okay, so. So if we wanted to go further in the models and try to calibrate the models, of course, that's this question will come uh, uh, will come immediately. No, so is it realistic that uh, that uh, the rigidity for the price of capital is similar to the one for uh, for labor? Could we exploit the fact that the the horizon uh, can be can be different? So, so I think that this is a very good question. Uh, I think now we say we bring the argument, the argument will still be true, but it will be uh, mitigated potentially if you have different rigidities uh, struck. And then we go in the empirics. Uh, if at some point we we decided we want to push further uh, the theoretical part and, and try to, to curb the calibration, then that's a question that naturally uh, we will have to to tackle and we'll have to enrich uh, the model. So that's a bit of a strategy on uh, on how to structure uh, the paper. So so now we can't say anything about that because we make it simplified. Uh, but but that's that doesn't mean that it's not a very relevant question with potentially in, in, important implications. Thank you. Okay, come on, have one. Sorry, Romain, okay. Romain, thanks so much for the presentation. It's very nicely done. Also, I really like uh, the Koskitan uh, discussion as well. Can I also add the additional points, the Koskitan's last point? Because he made a really nice point about pricing, right? So if you think about the pricing bond done by, let's say, two firms located in two different countries, you could potentially get uh, so-called, like, you know, the term of trade, right? But like, you know, import and export price, the duration, right? Can, can we just predict based on your risk factors you know, it's just the some factor of the firm to predict the uh, term of trade. Would, would that be the story that you can make? Or would that be, it's kind of like an opposite side of the, you know, sort of the consumption, you know, uh, sort of a, you know, it's the, it's the F, uh, prediction, which which the kind of literature not really good at explaining theoretically, doesn't match with the data, but this potentially, this risk factor could potentially from the firm side, would that, would, I'm th I think that a bit of big, big pictures. What do you think? You mean predicting the the firm level flows? Yes, yeah, so the term of trade potentially the you know the import price and the export price of the firm. Okay, okay. Uh, yes, potentially. I haven't I haven't really thought about that. Uh, so so yes, if I come with an answer, I will shoot from the hips. So yes, I will have to to think more. Uh, I think potentially yes, but. I, I I don't see it clearly now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think we need to move to the next session. Thank you very much.